Greetings, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Heath Robinson, and we're continuing on here with our six steps of GIS problem solving. We were just talking about step two, which is the design of the methodology. We said that that might sound like a large hurdle to some people who are newer to GIS, but that you gain exposure to the kinds of things that different GIS operations and functions do and what kinds of results they give in other classes. And I specifically designed my geospatial problem solving class to give students practice in uh, designing methodologies to solve different uh, questions over and over and over again. So you get exposure to that. But we also said that the core value of GIS, the really in-demand individuals, are those who can sit down and design that methodology. Okay, so let's move on then to step 2.5. Oh, I got you, didn't I? You thought I was going to say three. Well, we're not quite to step three yet. I like to sneak this little step 2.5 in there, which is select the appropriate software for the methodology. Once you look at your methodology, you may have different operations in there, different functions that you're going to need uh, that are available only in certain software packages. It's very common for me, and it probably is for you, uh, to use the Esri ArcGIS software package. Uh, it's very powerful. Uh, it has uh, some great things going for it. You can do some fantastic analysis in it, but it's not the only software package out there. And part of what you have to do in your training as a GIS analyst is uh, to get familiar with other software programs that are out there so that you know what their advantages are and you know what their disadvantages are. You know what they're really, uh, you can do really easily in particular packages, what is much harder to do in other packages, uh, what you can do in one that you just can't do in another. So just as you don't want to have tunnel vision on just a particular methodology that we talked about, you also don't want to have tunnel vision for just one particular piece of software. Because it really is true that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you only know one GIS software package, then of course you're going to have to go to it every single time, no matter what problem you're trying to solve or question you're trying to answer, no matter what kind of methodology you're trying to execute. And that's really no good. You really need to get exposure to a variety of different software packages and really learn their advantages and disadvantages and what can be done easily in one and what can be done easily in another. That's why you do your methodology first. What has to be done to get where I want to go? Then you say, based on that, based on the functions that I have to do, based on the operations that I'm going to have to perform, what software package am I going to use? So you look at your methodology and then you make that determination. Don't make it harder on yourself than it has to be if you're using a software package that really isn't ideally suited to the execution of your methodology. So step 2.5 is to look very carefully at your methodology, use your background information on different software packages, and choose the appropriate software package. Once you've done that, then you are ready to progress to step 3, which is to collect or create the necessary data for the project. This step may be the one that is most time consuming in your project. In fact, I would say that it's very likely in most every case that uh, I encounter that the place where students have to spend the most time is right here in step three. So if you're trying to plan out your project and you're thinking, where do I need to block out the most amount of time? Generally speaking, you want to make sure that you block plenty of time to collect and create data. This can be an extremely time-consuming part of the GIS problem-solving process. And it's one that people don't realize. Uh, people think that they're going to be able to very easily get data, uh, very easily find data, and it's still not true. Now, I know that we live in the age of big data today. I know that we can access information very easily by the Internet and very quickly. Uh, I also know that depending on what it is you're studying, if you're really able to harness uh, the internet and big data and these kinds of things, you can be awash in data. But you still have to be careful because you still have to be able to access that data. For instance, I saw a, a absolutely fantastic project by a student uh, who was doing uh, some heat mapping of emotions about different topics in the news across the world. So uh, how do people feel about, say, the war in Afghanistan at a particular time or some other global event across the world? So what this student did uh, was to go to Twitter and searched millions and millions and millions of tweets for different emotion words 
words, and then all of these tweets were geotagged, and he was able to bring them in uh, and then create heat maps for uh, different kinds of emotion words for the tw fantastic project. Very, very interesting. How long does it take to get into like the Twitter API, extract all of these tweets, write the program that's going to search for all of these different emotion words and so forth? Well, a long time. That's data creation. Yeah, it's out there. It's, it's in these forms of all these tweets that are out there. He's got lots of data for it, but it's not accessible. So even in a situation like that, you have to be careful. But even if you're not working in an environment like that and you think, oh, I just need some roads, uh, for this particular city that I'm trying to do a GIS project about. Yes, you might be able to go to the city's GIS page and download some shapefiles about uh, the roads. But you don't know who digitized them. You don't know that it's got adequate metadata. You don't know the digitizing was done well. You don't know if it has the attribute information that you need. Even if you think that you can just go to a certain place and download some information, you may not be able to. And you really are going to have to do a lot of quality control in there to make sure that you actually do have the data that is necessary to go through the methodology that you designed. So you want to be extremely sure that you block a lot of time for collecting or creating data. How do you get data? How do you find data? Students always want to know, how do I find GIS data? Because it certainly does seem that you should be able to download a whole bunch of it from the internet. And you can, but like I said, you've got to deal with uh, quality control and making sure that it is actually exactly what you need in order to do your methodology. We don't have a fantastic way of searching for GIS data online right now. Uh, that may change, but at the moment, uh, you know, you do a Google search for some GIS data, you're looking for some keywords, and you're hoping that somebody will allow you to download some uh, zip files and so forth of different shape files that are relevant to your project. If you can go online, you know, there is certainly lots of stuff from lots of reputable sources if it's what you need. Again, if you can do that, you still don't want to think that your process is going to be easy because you've got to download it and really check it to be sure that it is what you need. I tell this story all the time. It's a great one uh, for this kind of information. I had a student once who was going to do a GIS project about uh, network analysis uh, along a highway between two different cities. And so in order to do a network analysis about the roads, you're going to have to have a road layer of all the highways and so forth. Well, uh, she went online and she knew that she could download road data, road GIS data from uh, a state uh, GIS website or something like that. So she just downloaded it and then she went to go try to do her project and her network analysis. And uh, the, the network analysis was not working at all. The network analysis, the computer system would never have anybody get on the road. She was trying to compute shortest distances and the amount of time required to get from one city to another by different uh, interstates and highways and so forth. And it was obvious that the best way and most efficient way to get from one city to another was by the interstate. But the computer system, when we were running this, uh, would never have uh, the person get on the interstate. That never happened. And so we were trying to figure out why. What's going on here? Why isn't the computer giving us in the very basic run through the obvious solution? Well, as it turned out, it was because none of the on-ramps to the interstate had been digitized in this particular GIS file. That the GIS file, the shape file, was uh, just for, sort of for cartographic purposes. It had not been designed for network analysis. So even though she thought she could go and just download this fantastic data set uh, to do some analysis with, as it turned out, the quality control was what really was the problem. That data set was not designed for the kind of analysis that she was trying to do. None of those on-ramps to the highways had been digitized. So as far as the computer was concerned, there was no topological connection between any of the local roads and the interstate. So it, it never knew to tell somebody to get on it. It was impossible as far as the computer was concerned. So let that be a warning in this kind of situation. If you think, oh, I can just download here, fantastic. They've got all of the state highways, for example. You can download it, but it may not be the quality that you're looking for. So please keep that in mind, even if you think that you can just download data, please be aware that it may not be everything that you need it to be. So please make sure that you're accounting for things like that when you're putting together your timeline for your GIS project. Other methods for getting data. Well, digitizing. 
Just like with that example of that highway data set, it might very well be the case that you have to go in even today and do some manual digitization of satellite imagery, some different maps, older maps, whatever. Uh, it may be the case that you have to spend some time working on your data set uh, in a very manual sort of way doing editing. Also during this particular phase, hopefully uh, you're going to be working in a database environment. I talk about that in a specific dedicated class once people are familiar with the needs of their data. You may very well need to create a specific database to hold the kinds of data that are necessary for a particular GIS project. If you're going out and you're creating some very sophisticated data sets in order to answer your question or solve your problem, it's probably going to be extremely beneficial to you not to just work uh, in a very ad hoc way, but to spend some time actually designing a database to hold and receive the data that you're going to be generating. If you do that, it's really going to pay off because the database is really going to allow you to control uh, the quality of the data that's coming in and manage it very efficiently. Database construction, especially geodatabase construction, are huge topics to get into. And there is an entire specialization within GIS for people who get very interested in designing geodatabases and of course people who can uh, design them uh, for large data sets and manage them well are very much in demand. So it may be the case that you need to design one for the data that you're going to be creating or collecting, and so you would do that here within this step. Field work. This is another fantastic way that you can create data if you need it that you might not think about if you just have the idea that a GIS person is sitting down in front of a computer system uh, clicking the mouse and typing uh, buttons on a keyboard. If you've got your methodology diagrammed out, you know exactly what you need to do to get to your end result. It may be the case that in order to create some data, you're going to need to go someplace. Maybe you're interested in doing a GIS study about uh, volcanoes in Hawaii or about some kind of coral reef you may need to actually go out into the field with a GPS receiver, with other equipment, in order to create a data set. So yes, you can be doing GIS and you can actually be out in the field collecting data. The data collection can be huge, as we've said, and it may very well be the case that if you're doing some GIS, you may need to create a data set that's going to require you to be out in the field and potentially maybe even for all, uh, a long time, maybe you go for an entire summer into uh, some field location in order to generate and create a data set with uh, GPS receivers and with sophisticated instrumentation in order to create the data set that's necessary to answer your question or solve your problem. This is why methodology comes first. Let's say that you're interested in doing a GIS and you're interested in working in some kind of remote field location. You do not, you do not want to go out to that location with some kind of vague idea about what you're doing, what we would call a topic in this particular uh, GIS procedure that I'm outlining here, because you won't know what kind of data you need to collect in the field. Right? If you don't know how you're going to go about solving the problem, you won't know what data you need in order to perform those operations on. I mean, maybe you're doing some things, but you don't know that the things you are doing are actually advancing you towards your goal. So if you're going to go out to Hawaii to study volcanoes, you're going to go out to some uh, other location into the field to, to create a GIS data set that's going to be necessary for it, you want to be very, very certain that you know what you're collecting is exactly what you need to answer your question or solve your problem. The worst possible situation you could be in is to want to do some kind of GIS analysis of some remote location where you have to do some field work but you've got a very vague idea of what you're trying to do and you don't have a methodology, but then you go out into the field, you collect something, but then you don't really know whether or not what you're collecting is what's going to get you to the question you want to answer or problem you want to solve because you maybe you don't even know that, uh, or you collect some data and you realize that you don't have it all or that it's not in the format that you need. That's why designing your methodology comes first, because you want to know when you go out into the field that I'm trying to answer this question 
or I'm trying to solve this problem. In order to do that, I'm going to have to follow this methodology according to my flowchart. In order to follow this flowchart, I'm going to need data set X and Y. I can only do that in the field. I need to make sure that I got to the field and collect exactly X and exactly Y. Also, this is a great place to point out that if you are interested in working in a remote location out in the field and you want somebody to pay for it or you want to put some kind of expedition together, then what you have to do in order to get that funded is show that you know what you need to do out in the field. You can't just start with a topic, oh, I want to study volcanoes in Hawaii. Well, there are a lot of people who want to do something about volcanoes in Hawaii. No one's going to give you a, a grant or fund your research or fund your project or whatever it is you're doing if you just say hey well I'm gonna go to Hawaii for uh, three months and I'm gonna collect some data about uh, volcanoes and I'm gonna do some kind of project that won't work what you would have to do is you'd have to say I'm trying to learn this I have this specific question I have this specific problem about volcanoes in Hawaii or wherever whatever your field situation is going to be that I want to answer in order to answer that question I'm going to do exactly this methodology in order to execute this methodology I need this particular data set that must be collected in the field and if I go out and I collect exactly this data set and you could specify that very very clearly according to a database your database schema if you're designing databases I need exactly this data and I'm going to collect it in exactly this way and if I am able to go and collect this data then I will be able to come back and I will give you the answer to this question or solve this problem okay then that's somebody that people are interested in that's the kind of person who will be able to go on an expedition to a remote location if they know that up front and they're very specific about that the person who is sitting with a very vague topic will never be able to do that so that is again why establishing your question comes before establishing your methodology once you've got the methodology then you sit down and find out what kind of data you're going to need then you go out and collect that data specifically in order to answer that question that's the way this goes along note down here starred note about quality assurance and quality control I've talked about that before even if you think you can get data very easily if even if you go and collect your own data regardless you really have to sit down you have to comb over your data every single aspect of it make sure that it is exactly what you need and make sure that it is correct because it's very much the case that garbage in garbage out you can design an absolutely flawless GIS methodology you can be an expert in a GIS software package and execute that methodology without any errors whatsoever but if the data that you're using is flawed or incorrect or wrong you're still going to get the wrong answer so garbage in garbage out that's a huge part of this and finally I'll mention again that the most important thing to remember when you're planning your GIS project is that this takes time don't think that you're going to be able to get your data very very quickly very very easily nine times out of ten you're not please make sure that you account for that every time you do a GIS project okay that's the collection and the creation of our data that's step three in our six steps of GIS problem solving once you have your data collected and created exactly what you need to go through the methodology that was designed in step two you'll be ready to move forward as I said that's a big step and it's actually a huge hurdle that gets cleared when you finally do have your data collected created and completely ready to go you really feel like you're on the downhill side of your GIS project once you get over that hurdle so when you join me for the next lesson we will go on and talk about step four in our six steps of GIS problem solving looking forward to seeing you there